So our next speaker is Javier Crespo. Um, he's an embedded systems engineer and he has just co-founded a company called SC Robotics where he does uh, consulting, especialists in electronics and IoT, etc. And he's also an open source uh, enthusiast and he has co-founded a local hacker space in Vigo in Spain called iIndustrial, which means the Industrialos in Galician, something like that. <laughs> it's more difficult than that. I knew it. So every year we see how the number of satellites in orbit increases and companies like Starlink, Amazon, or SpaceX intend to launch fleets of thousands of satellites in the next few years. Can they operate satellites the same way we do nowadays? Please welcome Xavi. Um, thank you very much, Holu. Um, my name is Javier Crespo. I'm from Spain. And as he said, uh, I'm starting a new company right now. It's called SC Robotics. And today I'm going to talk about space operations. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that was actually born uh, at this same event in the last edition in, that was held in Madrid. Um, as Juan Lu said, the number of satellites in orbit is rapidly growing. Uh, companies are launching fleets of tens, hundreds, thousands of satellites. Yesterday I read that SpaceX filled a request to launch 30,000 new satellites, I think, um, which is crazy. So Red and I wrote a poster last year to, to analyze how could we uh, leverage AI and machine learning um, using a special hardware on board satellites. In a, it's a field called edge computing, which is uh, rapidly growing. Um, but we found a problem, and the problem is that you need hardware, and you need ambition, and you need a satellite. So it risk, it's risky. So in our work group, we started discussing what can we do about it. And we came up with this cool idea of using Subnox data, get the data, and do a data science project with it. So this is what Polaris is. Polaris is a, it's a Python tool for satellite operators to explore and analyze data obtained from the Satnox network. Well, here's the outline. Uh, before I continue, I want to share some figures because the project is fairly new. We've been working on it for six to eight months and we've already gained some attention. Uh, we have six, 68 members on Riot. It's a public channel you can join. Uh, 350 commits by seven different people, over 50 merge requests, over 50 issues, and we've been selected to participate into two Summer of Code programs. Um, I will talk about that later. So, yeah, this is Polaris. This is what we call the Polaris pipeline. Uh, it's divided into three different commands. The first one is Polaris Fetch. Uh, it's the one which uh, retrieves the data from the Subnock databases. Then we pass this data to Polaris Learn. This is the core of the project, is where, where the magic happens. And then the last command is to visualize the results. And we, we show them in, in a web server. I'm going to go into the details of each of these commands. Uh, the first one is Polaris Fetch. And first step is to get the data. Uh, you get the data, it's uh, raw data, base64 format and you have to decode the data. And this means you have to find which fields are on each frame. You have to find, for instance, is this a telemetry frame? Is this a data frame? Um, you have to find all this information. And then it, there's a, a last step, which we call normalize. Because usually you get the data, um, for instance, some, some values are in volts, other values are in millivolts. Sometimes you get um, raw ADC values. So data has to be consistent. We convert everything to international system units. And then we put this data into a JSON file and we pass this data uh, by to the next command. Here in Polaris Learn, um, first step, uh, we do some feature engineering for feature augmentation. The more data we have, the better, and uh, the, the more features, the better. And then we pass this data to, uh, through an algorithm called XGBoost. And this is useful for calculating uh, feature importances. Um, we calculate a matrix of uh, cross-correlation values. 
and again, we put this, these results into a JSON file, and we pass this to um, the next command, final command. Um, this visualized command is just, um, it's a simple web server, and we render this graph structure using a D3JS web component. And we, put, we just have to open a web server, and user can interact with the data. And I will, I will show you a uh, demo now. So yeah, for the demo, we've, uh, we've prepared a demo with using the, the light cell to telemetry data, two months of data. And if you want to check it out on yourself, uh, you can visit this repo, this, um, this website. And if we have internet. All right, so this is, this is what you, you should see. You will see all, well, can you, can you see it there? All right, so these are the, all the um, parameters that the light cell to satellite has. And these are the relationships uh, it has. And for instance, I'm gonna show you a, a few points. Um, if you see this one here, this one here, uh, if you cannot read it, it says uh, minus X temperature. So uh, we think it's the temperature in the minus X side of the satellite. And if you check all the nodes that, that surround this node, so that means the nodes that are related somehow to the minus X temperature, you will see battery information. This is battery temperature, more battery temperature. Um, this is power more power, well, battery voltage, more power. And what this means is that the system has found that somehow when the minus X temperature changes, the battery voltage changes, the power of the system changes. So you can see clearly a cluster here of data which is related. There is another, another node which is really interesting This is, this is the ADCS node, the positioning uh, mode. And if you check which parameters are related to the ADCS mode, you will see gyros, um, uh, power value, another gyro, the rotation rate, uh, quaternion value, uh, torque, so uh, you, you can see how the system has found that whenever the ADCS mode changes, the rotation and the position of the satellite changes. And now back to the slides. And yeah, as you can see, it's um, the, the results, you can expect that. Um, it's fairly straightforward, but the magic is that the system has found these relationships. We have not, tell, we have not told the, the machine, the computer anything. He has just realized that those parameters were related to each other. And this is just the beginning. Uh, in the next steps, we can do a lot more things. For instance, in the fetch part, um, we can merge orbital data with other sources, such as uh, solar events, for instance. In the, in the learning part, with uh, much more features, we can do predictions. We can do a more complex time series analysis um, to detect outliers, warnings, um, errors, and we can also implement a feedback loop that you see here. So for instance, if we, if we say that um, this is an error, please take care, um, the user can say, no, this is okay, and we from that. And yeah, so there are a lot of more things to, to, to do. Uh, just to wrap up, I think that with this very simple analysis, we have found already some really interesting stuff. And to, to do more complex things and to validate the results, we would like to, to work together with uh, satellite operators. For instance, the like to, to team, um, we would like to show them these results and tell them what do they think? Um, are we missing something? What do you need? 
And of course, uh, the, the bigger the constellations, the more the satellites, the more the data, and, and that's um, better for us. And yeah, we are really happy with the results. We think Polaris um, or a tool like this can be used for uh, to automate satellite operations. But not only that, but you can also find, um, thanks to Polaris, deeper relationships and do a more complex analysis than what a human would do. And before I finish, because um, I have had this discussion twice or three times uh, in the last few months, um, we've been selected to participate in two two Summer of Code programs, uh, Google Summer of Code and Insta Summer of Code in Space. And um, I want to give you some tips because I was discussing yesterday with Juan Lu and with other people uh, what did we do wrong and what can we improve. First tip is to, to build a team of mentors because um, it's fairly time consuming and not, it's not only about the time, but one mentor can be an expert on one field and other mentor can be an expert on another field and that's really useful for, um, for students. Um, yeah, of course, be aware of the time, not only as a mentor, but as a student. You, as a mentor, also have to, to give a clear roadmap to the students, uh, because otherwise they will, be working, they will be working on different things and they will wander around the project. And I think one of the most important things, uh, and I think Juan agrees, you have to pick students who had previously collaborated with the project, if possible. And by collaboration, I mean they can commit something, open an issue, or just even pop out in the, in the public channel and ask questions. But before the, the project uh, submission, they should be involved in the project because that, that's going to uh, make things smoother for everyone. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, thanks everyone for, for your attention. Thanks for inviting me. And if you have questions, I'm here for you. Thanks for the presentation. It's a nice presentation and the nice work. Um, I got a question related to uh, edge computing. What you do, like um, in edge computing, you need uh, and the TensorFlow kind of TensorFlow. If you want to run on edge computing, then you need a huge amount of data. In that case, like you run out of your memory. Uh, do you know how you are going to handle the high performance computing on the edge computing? Um, well, in this case, Polaris is not meant to be run uh, on the edge because, well, because uh, it's for satellite operators, so they don't need special, I mean, they have computers. They don't need, um, like, the NVIDIA, the Jetson. They, they can run it on big computers, so you don't have that, that constraint. Yeah, but if you want something to decide on the space, like if you're running a machine learning algorithm like a XG boot or a, a feature engineering that you run on the edge computing, then in, in that case, you need a huge number of data that uh, in order to decide something uh, uh, and then compute a machine learning model on the edge. Um, so in that case, if you, if you put a low cost, like a Raspberry Pi, that could be useful, but still we could uh, um, have a problem of running that on the- uh, Yeah, of course. Of the if, amount if, of the data. If you run it in the edge, you will have a, it will be difficult uh, currently. But it's also true that this field is it's rapidly growing and there are a lot of tools uh, like TensorFlow Little and like uh, NVIDIA has some really good uh, boards and some really good um, software tools to run on the edge. So I think with the, like, uh, this analysis, with the, uh, sorry, with the amount of data we had, you could run it in the edge because it's not that, uh, it's that new, big. It's a numeric data, so... Yeah. It's okay. If it in case of images, then it would be a kind Yeah, of in case of images, it will be more, more difficult, but you can use embedded GPUs, for instance. Uh, in, in edge? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, then size would be another issue for cube compute. Cube um, you, can, you can take a look at, for instance, the, the NVIDIA, the Jetson Nano, 
and you could do some pretty cool things with images and, and uh, GPU on, in the edge. And there are already companies doing that yeah. in orbit. The, the, the smaller in size, you mean? Like. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so if I've understood correctly, uh, what Polaris actually does is tr it tries to find correlations between uh, the different uh, uh, parameter values based on what the s uh, a satellite gives off as telemetry. Uh, how can this be uh, useful to an, to an operator for actually automating things, apart from visualizing and understanding better the correlations of these parameters? Oh, well, this is just the, the very first step. Um, uh, right now we're just trying to understand what can we find automatically. Uh, like these relationships, as I said, they were fairly straightforward, but you can find deeper relationships and this can help operators to, to do the, their job faster. That's the first step, and automation, of course, will it's one step further. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a nice question. So the thing is that with the graph, can you show the graph, please? <laughs> so the thing is that uh, you're actually building knowledge of your spacecraft. So the operators somehow they know, you know, like. The attitude mode will impact the gy gyrometers, all those kind of things, all the torque. Uh, that's, I think that's where we are at the moment. But the computer doesn't know. So uh, when we run that, the computer is actually building the knowledge itself. So this is a sort of first step for a more advanced AI solution to build reasoning. Like if you change the, yes, uh, the, the attitude mode, then it already knows what's going to be impacted. And then you can do more things from there. Uh, thank you. Um, so the graph is really cool and it's like super awesome to see, but if I as a satellite operator plugged my data in, I could definitely see being overwhelmed when like the first result comes back. Um, so I'm curious why you picked like the 3D graph versus a 2D graph or a table and uh, if you have any ideas of how to kind of start analyzing the results. Yeah, um, well, it's quite difficult to represent the results. Um, this is, I think this is, uh, it's not easy, but it's, um, once you ha get the idea of, uh, you, you just have to check the clusters and go cluster by cluster, you can easily spot the clusters. You can, you can navigate to, you can check the website, but with, uh, at first sight, you can really spot which clusters and you just look for um, one of the, the central nodes and you start thinking. Um, of course, it, it's not um, direct, but you can do also, previously you can do an analysis of which feature is more important. Um, we can do that too, Polaris can do that too, and it will give you a list of uh, this feature is very important, take a look at it, and you can find it here uh, with the search box and in, um, in the graph. And yeah, you start, you start working little by little. It's, yeah. I think it's, well, this view is uh, difficult. It can be overwhelming, as you said. But I also think it's one of the best ways to, to, to show all the information without losing information. Sorry for, for the guys on the, for the streaming. Yeah, with the 2D graph, I was saying that uh, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to see where the edges are going. So who asked the questions? Uh, oh yeah, oh, sorry, I was watching you, but. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have time, I think. All right, thank you very much for your attention.